4.0, do I have a motion to go into executive session to discuss the bargaining contract between the board and the Scarborough Administrative Association to return to public session? So moved. Second. Very good. We are adjourned.
Some adjustments and <clears throat> number 11 new business um, add the following 11.15 motion to approve a donation from Robert Mitchell for West for um, Wentworth School number 12 unfinished business this comes from the April 2015 business meeting um, and finds its its place on the agenda at 12.1 Second reading of policy ECAD security camera system and second reading under 12.2 of um, policy ECAD-R security camera system administrative procedure and that would of course bump um, adjournment to 13.0. Sure, what's, what's the question? Um, so item 11.7 um, says it's the second reading of the 2015-2016 school calendar. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Um, should it be the first reading? No, it's the second reading. So according to policy BG, so you had the second reading April 2nd and you voted down the, count, the budget, Right. correct? And according to policy BG, um, if the policy is not approved by a majority vote, the process for the policy is ended unless the board agrees to table consideration of the policy to a specific date. This is something that requires two uh, board votes, a first reading and a second reading. So you had the first and the second reading. The second reading did not was not completed because it was it was voted down. So they, we need to have an approved you count. You had to table, sir. I'm sorry, but you had to table in order to reconsider it. You voted down the policy, mm -hmm. so it has to go back. So policy BG says at the next regular board meeting or later, if so agreed by the board, the policy shall be placed on the agenda for a second reading and actions. Am amendments may be made and acted upon. If the policy is not approved by majority vote, the process for that policy is ended unless the board agrees to table consideration. This, this of is the not a policy. A specific date. This is not a policy. So, but it went back to the policy committee. Is that correct? It's yes, but it is re it is reviewed and brought forward by the policy committee. It is not a policy. It is the school calendar. The school calendar requires a reading. It's a, a first reading that's approved and a second reading that is approved. That is, the second reading is the adoption of the, sc of the school calendar. Do you have a policy for that? I looked I through all I the policies. I don't know. I think I've answered your question. We need to move on with our business. Um, so can you just answer me? So if I feel you are not <coughs> following the policies correctly, what mm -hmm. my, um, my rec how, how do I rectify you that? You can contact the uh, board chair Good after this meeting. Tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Um, 6.0, the superintendent's report. Okay. I'd like to uh, start by uh, talking about the community dialogue. We did have community dialogue number three on April 30th. Um, uh, many of you folks were there, and it was uh, really a great success. I do want to thank everyone who participated. It was a very rigorous and productive session. This had more than 40 sessions of dialogue that were hosted within the three hours of the event. It's actually one of the larger numbers of uh, dialogues that I've, that I've seen in a community dialogue. So there was lots of activity, lots of topics. It was particularly gratifying to have a number of students uh, Wentworth through high school participating. Um, I think that everyone agreed, we saw on the exit uh, sheets as well, that they added a very authentic student, student voice to many of the dialogue topics. Um, the proceedings from the event uh, will be posted to the school website where they will be accessible and they are also will be searchable online. That should be happening uh, this next week. The best part is that those who could not attend the community dialogue or those that were at the community dialogue that didn't get to all the sessions that they would have liked uh, will be able to review the considerations that were captured in those sessions. You'll get to take a look at the notes and you can actually add your own thoughts to those. So essentially the dialogue does continue and that's online. 
The Leadership Council will be synthesizing all of the data from the dialogue and will be refreshing our plan, uh, that is the plan that has focused us um, since uh, 2011. And it will carry us and focus our work for the next 24 months. The resulting plan from this round, uh, we are calling our 24-month student-centered learning plan, uh, really reflecting the, the district's primary <coughs> focus of creating a student-centered learning environment uh, within every classroom, in every school, and across our entire school community. So we'll be uh, talking more about that later. Um, I'd like to direct your attention to the, the screen. This says Joint Finance Committee meeting. Of course, we know that's not the case, uh, but this is the material that I covered on May 4th um, at the Joint Finance Committee meeting. That's the Finance Committee meeting for, that includes both the Town Council Finance and the School Board Finance. Um, it's been readily apparent from me, uh, from the Budget Forum, from the public hearing that we had, um, newspaper articles that I see, some letters that I've seen, that there are three beliefs um, that are being touted out there in the community as facts. And I would like to address them because um, they're fundamentally flawed. And I'd like to share instead some facts that are based on research and analysis that actually debunks these beliefs. Uh, the first is that state reported per pupil costs are not accurately reflecting actual school expenses as some of these expenses are actually carried by the town. Well, indeed, in Scarborough and likely in many other communities, there are some synergies that are used, there are some shared services that are used, and, um, and uh, of course, they, whenever that's done, it always benefits the taxpayer in the town. But the fact <coughs> of the matter is that when we look, there's actually two areas of cost that were identified here in the town of Scarborough um, that may uh, uh, that involve town and school working together that may skew per pupil expenditures. Um, one is the fact that the school central office is located in the town's building, and the other is that ground in, uh, is in terms of uh, the, the shared work in grounds maintenance and facility scheduling. So um, basically what we've done is we've adjusted the per pupil spending figures um, to look at the calculations that were, or assumptions that you can see below. Um, when we do that, there's no appreciable difference in, in the placement of Scarborough in terms of the relative um, uh, state average or in terms of our, our cohort that we compare ourselves with. What we did was we assumed that office space would, um, and this is, I think, A-level office space, would call, cost $17 per square foot. And at 3,000 square feet that the school occupies here in this building, we, caught, we, charged, uh, we uh, adjusted and um, took a favorable adjustment of $51,000, that the school gets a favorable adjustment. Um, I could say that that's a, very, um, that's a very hefty price for what the space that we would be paying for. Grounds maintenance and facility scheduling, at, we estimated at 70% of total cost would be equal to $368,000. Again, a very hefty estimate. Um, this is something that the town manager and I did together, and we agreed to make the estimates hefty so that we could try to um, put, put this, um, this uh, sort of flawed belief to rest. So the total cost advantage that would go to the schools if uh, these assumptions were true would be uh, a positive favorable advantage of $419,000 or $135 per pupil. The allocation of $135 per pupil um, needed to be done to the expense type. So we took $17 and we added it to school and its and system administrative costs. And we took the balance of the $135, which is $118, and we added that to transportation and facilities. As I said, when we did that, we were adjusting for any possible uh, skew of the per pupil numbers, and there was no appreciable difference in our position in terms of how we compare with local districts, um, the state average, and the cohort that we like to, co uh, to um, compare ourselves to. I also made a note there saying that the total cost advantage estimate is high and adjusted, but it also assumes that Scarborough is the only district that benefits from shared services with their town. We can look across the way to Cape Elizabeth and know that 
The Cape Elizabeth School um, Central Office is located in the town office. The uh, Cape Elizabeth um, uh, Community Services is actually a part of the, the, school, um, the school organization. So that's belief number one. Belief number two, school spending is out of control. This is kind of a two-part belief that school spending is out of control and that the cause, and, and it is the cause of tax increases. So um, what I can tell you is that we spent a good amount of time. We went back 20 years in the data from 1994 to 2014. That's all that, that, that the, is available in terms of the most recent is up to 2014. And we can say that um, Scarborough had the lowest per pupil cost lower than the local cohort average and lower than the state average for the last 20 years. For that same 20 years, 1994 to 2014, had Scarborough invested at the state average, at the number that was the state average that we were below, we were so far below that the schools would have received over the 20 years an additional investment of more than $46 million million dollars. That's an average of $2.3 million per year for this period of time. $2.3 million on average invested in the schools every year for 20 years. That did not happen. For 1994 to 2014, had Scarborough invested at the local cohort average. We have a local co cohort of 10 districts. Um, I read the list, I think, at the uh, budget forum. I don't have the list in front of me but they do include places like Kennebunk and Gorham and Cape Elizabeth and Falmouth and um, Yarmouth. Yarmouth. Yarmouth and a few others. Um, so for that same 20 years, had Scarborough invested in their schools at just the average of what those cohort group did the, um, in terms of the per pupil rate, the schools would have received an investment of an additional 800 I mean, uh, $84 million, $84 million, which would average for that 20-year period per year um, better than $4.4 million more invested on average per year for 20 years. In a comparison, so what we do in education is we like to triangulate data. That's good local data, so what, what, what can you look at nationally? So we went to the National Center for Educational Statistics, which is part of the, the, um, the, uh, the National, uh, what is that called, uh, National Council of Education, or um, Monique, do you remember? What is it? Yeah, it's, anyway, it's a subset of the, of the National e Educational Council. Um, so we went to them, and what they will do is they will identify a matched national cohort, and they did that. Um, and they matched us with 16 other like districts. The good point was that one of the districts that came up was MSAD 51, which was a good match, and a good demographic match for us. And when we looked at a national cohort, again, it's one data, one data point for one year, because that's all we had available. But it does give us some sense that, again, when we looked at those, that national cohort of 17 districts, we were spending less than the average of those districts. So rather than out of control spending, which is clearly not the case, either for, for Maine, for Southern Maine, or, or nationally, um, is, is actually the, um, not the driver of any uh, local tax increase. The local t tax increase has really been the result of a loss and a significant loss of non-tax revenues, and that's been happening since FY09, this, where state subsidy has decreased. Um, if we include the $1 million that we anticipate that we, were, were, that we will be losing this year, it's a loss of, of state revenue by more than 58% of that, of that revenue. And the last one that I wanted to deal with is school spending growth should be limited to the increase in the cost of living as defined by an accepted measure like C CPI. Well, um, again, I think that town and school leaders all share a goal of developing something that's predictable and stable in terms of the growth in the local tax rate. 
I think that for myself and my team in the schools, we would love nothing more than to have some predictability about what is going to be invested in the schools from one year to the next, rather than always moving into this zone of, oh my God, what is going to happen? So we can all benefit from such a metric or a standard. We'd be happy to, to accept that. However, CPI and similar indices are not the appropriate uh, benchmark. Um, it, it, it is not an appropriate benchmark for budget growth in schools or any other human resources intensive, and this is an important part, non-revenue generating organization. Analysis of expenditure growth during those 20 years that I, that I uh, told you about um, in the 10 local cohort districts across the state and in Scarborough shows that there is a, an average annual increase in schools ranging from about 4.4% to 5% on average. In times of economic hardship, the other districts have also reduced some of their expenditure growth, but they have still maintained throughout that 20 years higher per pupil investments. Districts with, who have invested at that higher level of, uh, of investment and who have maintained that over time, as you might imagine, have more easily weathered economic downturns without the same kind of program and infrastructure damage that have, has been suffered here in Scarborough. So I, I do think that it's important to, um, to, to examine some beliefs, examine some of what uh, people are saying and touting in the community, and really um, spending some time taking a look at what the data tells us, because I think it can be very informative. I've asked um, Joanne as well to speak about adult education, another area where there seems to be a good amount of confusion. Yes. The definition of uh, adult education is activities that develop knowledge and skills to meet immediate long-range educational objectives for adults who have completed or interrupted formal schooling and have accepted adult roles and responsibilities. The program's uh, activities include to foster uh, development of fundamental tools for adult learning, adult literacy, prepare students for post-secondary educational programs, college transition, and for post-secondary career, career prep, vocational certificate programs, or any new or different careers through skill development and enriched at qualities of life. At the Scarborough Adult Education Learning Center, we are committed to provide adult basic education and English language learning, learner instruction, as well <coughs> as adult high school diploma completion, including the HiSET diploma. About two years ago, um, GED was changed to a different program, which is now called HiSET Diploma. We offer career and uh, certification opportunities for all adults, and our college career transition classes are designed to assist students both academically and through career exploration. A high school diploma, we offer um, distant learning for a high school diploma for the adults. Um, this year, we have over 20 uh, students who are enrolled in trying to complete their uh, high school diploma. We have credit recovery for some Scarborough High School students. Again, this is through online learning. In uh, FY14, we provided classes for 41 students at Scarborough High School, and uh, we continue that through the uh, adult learning. Career preparation is, I have to say, probably one of the areas that we have done, uh, we've seen the most growth. Um, we have accelerated our programs for career and college preparation so that our citizens have opportunities to find, advance, or change their careers with professional assistance. We offer free college and career counseling to the community and have had a great deal of success in counseling with 11 recipients for these activities. In addition to career exploration, the college transition academic classes have been limited to AccuPlace or math preparation, and we had 12 students who participated in that. In the certificate programs, we started about three years ago in off offering a CNA program with over 30 participants earning their uh, CNA certificate. And this year we have run two classes. We're planning for another class during the summer, and we anticipate 23 CNAs uh, to have obtained the certificate by the fall. Um, along with the certificate programs, we have offered uh, pharmacy tech, certified medical assistant, and dental assistant. Another program that is offered through adult ed is the English language learner classes 
that um, since uh, spring of 2014 have really expanded. We have partnered with Portland Public Schools for their overflow and we have uh, currently 15 students who are enrolled and looking at uh, 21 uh, for enrollment through the summer for beginner and to advanced levels. The Learning Center offer also offers 100 classes throughout the school year ranging in arts including painting, languages, music, health strategies, self-improvement classes. We've had over 324 people in the community participate. Overall, during the last year, uh, FY14, we've had 544 um, people participate in the Scarborough Adult Learning Center. Good, thank you. Um, there are two pieces in your packet I just wanted to address uh, quickly. The 2014-2015 enrollment totals, um, uh, that was requested, and, and so that has, that's in your <coughs> packet. Um, it's interesting, if you look at the grand totals, um, from the beginning uh, this year, um, we have actually increased uh, by um, more than about 20, about 21, 21 <laughs> students. Thank you. You are quick with the numbers. Um, 20, 21 students. The second piece in your packet is the PLT sharing day. And I just want to remind board members that you are invited on May 22nd uh, to the celebration of teaching and learning in the Scarborough schools, which is the PLT sharing day. Um, the s schedule events is, is on your, um, your invitation there. And uh, things get uh, kicked off at around 7.45 uh, that morning. Um, last thing in terms of my report, I did want to ask um, uh, David Creech to speak about uh, the April 15th College and Career Exploration Day. Um, it was a big success. Uh, there were a lot of folks who contributed to that success. Uh, David, you want to speak to that? Good evening. Um, I think it's maybe a month ago I uh, started the conversation telling you a little bit about our plans. Um, so I'm happy to report that um, on April 15th we were able to pull off at Scarborough High School something I think it's rare for most high schools to be able to do. An important piece to this is, as I had mentioned the last time that I spoke to you, uh, we always talk in education about how it would be nice to do something outside the confines of the classroom, to do something for students above and beyond a typical day. So. With the support of local businesses and community members and with the support of our superintendent, um, what we did on April 15th was is we took uh, and created an educational opportunity for each grade level that was unique and different based on the grade level that they are in. So I'll start with uh, the 11th graders because that tends to be the one that probably wasn't seen as the, um, <laughs> the most fun event for that day. But uh, April 15th was targeted by the state of Maine for the day when the SATs have to be administered. So um, we had decided to make the SAT and the Accuplacer available to all our juniors at no cost. So on that particular day, juniors came in and tested from 7.45 to about 12.45. And when the testing was done, uh, we had a barbecue for them afterwards, and, and that was the, the day for the juniors. During that time, we realized that it was going to be difficult to have a regular school day for the rest of our students while we're testing the SATs, strict guidelines when it comes to testing. So we seized the opportunity, again, to work with the local business leaders to create three programs for the other grade levels. So the, the ninth and 10th graders were given the opportunity to participate in college visits. So our grade nine students, um, we started the day by having both the ninth and 10th graders um, observe a, a presentation by the Westbrook Regional Vocational Center and by PASS, Portland Arts and Technology High School. So as ninth and 10th graders, they got an opportunity to see all the wonderful programs that exist in those two vocational centers, knowing that in the 11th and 12th grade year, if they qualify, they can opt to attend some of those programs. So we exposed them to those first. Then we put them on buses, took the ninth graders to SMCC, and the 10th graders were split between UNE and USM. All three colleges created extensive programs for the students where we had teachers supervising them in groups and basically taking them through the campus uh, through the, for those three or four hours, going into classrooms, learning about programs and career opportunities. Uh, they got a chance to eat in the cafeteria where uh, all the college, and college was in full session. 
you've ever been to UNE or SMCC this time of year, absolutely beautiful. So um, the ninth and 10th graders had an opportunity to exp experience a college visit and see what programs are offered, maybe for some of them for the first time. Uh, that program ended with the students coming back to the high school right around the end of the regular school day. The seniors were probably our biggest challenge. Um, Liz Burks, Matt Parody, uh, Chris Chiazzo, myself, and Sue Cressy worked on a plan for them that we wanted to give them an experience just before they graduated that we thought would benefit them greatly. So um, first part one of the program was feeding them, huge for uh, high school seniors. So we had a, a nice breakfast for them. We had a workshop session in the morning in which 18 uh, local professionals came in. We had a two-hour workshop session where our local business leaders told us there really are some important skills that our seniors need to graduate with to be successful in career, in the workplace, and in college. We identified those three sets of skills as um, teamwork, uh, situational awareness, and, and communication skills. So 18 business leaders met with our students. We had 10 students per group. We designed a curriculum. Uh, Mr. Kiaz and I were just laughing about we had videos associated with what's really bad communication and what's really good communication. If any of you have ever seen League of Their Own, when he curses her out for missing the, the cutoff person, if you've ever seen that scene, it's very funny. It's an example of really poor communication. We kind of used videos and that kind of scheme to get the seniors um, interested and involved. And these uh, 18 business leaders basically took the videos took the format and created what we think is their own personal spin on how these skills have been important to them and their success as professional leaders. So when that session was done around 10 o'clock, um, Mr. Chiazzo and Ms. Burtz had worked very hard with Mr. Parity to create opportunities for every single senior to job shadow. So they left at 10 o'clock and they went to local businesses and got an opportunity to job shadow for a career that they were interested in. And when that day was completed, uh, basically they, they were on their own for the rest of the day. So um, some examples, not only do we have the local businesses, but we were able to take 10 students down to Portsmouth Shipyard that were interested in engineering. They got to go around with engineers. They got a chance to go into a nuclear power submarine. Um, all kinds of experiences like that that we felt would benefit them just before they graduated from high school. So. Um, all in all, the feedback that we've received has been extremely positive. Um, the, the, the most honest and best feedback I can share with you has been at least 25 parents have given me this information. They sent me an email and said, Mr. Creech, you need to know that when my child got up that morning, it was everything I could do to drag them in the car to get them to go to school. I don't want to go to UNE today. I don't want to go do a job shadow. I don't want to do these things. Every single one of those cases that started that way ended with they came home and that's all they talked about all night was what a great experience it was during the job shadow, how much they learned when they talked to the professionals, how cool it was to be at UNE or they didn't know SMCC offered all that it did. So I think uh, the learning for us as a school is that um, it's extremely important to provide these opportunities for our students. <coughs> so all in all, I think April 15th was a very successful day at high school. Thank you. Thank you, David. Any questions or comments for David? I'm sure, well, I have one. I'm sure it was a huge undertaking, so appreciate you and the committee that helped you do that because uh, this doesn't happen by just snapping your fingers, I know. So. It was a lot of work. A lot of work. Thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to reiterate what Dave said. It really was, um, I was very impressed with the business community and their, their dedication and devotion to this process. They were. Um, very open and forthright with resources uh, and ideas, and I think that's really what made it a success. Um, I did want to ask a question, obviously. Uh, it would be nice uh, to know and to see some of the follow back from those job shadows. So what's the plan for that kind of check back and follow up? Uh, the plan is twofold. Uh, first, we're going to try to gather information from the students in the form of a survey. Um, and then from the business leaders, we're going to do the same thing, except it's going to be more anecdotal. And I think we're going to send them a survey uh, we sent out thank yous, but we're going to follow up with, do you have any suggestions or any recommendations based on the experiences you had? And we'll take that information, put all of that together uh, once the school year ends, and, um, and use that to kind of formulate any plans we might do in the, in the future that are similar to this. And right. I didn't get a chance. I apologize. I should have. Thank you for bringing that up. 
uh, what Mr. Chiazzo mentioned too, uh, school leaders and, and business community members spent an enormous amount of time outside their regular work set schedule to make this uh, possible. So I, I want to thank them as well. And David, I just want, I know that we've talked about the business partners. We do have a, a council of school and business partners, some of which played a, an important role, and they're actually higher ed partners that we have. So um, we, they're still part of that group, but they are um, our higher ed partners that made the partnering with SMCC, with USM, and with um, University of New England possible because we have very active members from each of those um, higher ed institutes. And, and, and to speak to that, maybe the easiest piece to this from the school's perspective was we described to each of the, call, the, the individuals that Dr. Uh, Entwistle was referring to, we described to them uh, what we were interested in for a program. They did all the work. They set up everything in each of those colleges. Um, and as a matter of fact, um, great feedback from one of the colleges. Uh, USM indicated to us that um, what they learned putting together this uh, plan for our school uh, is something that they are now going to do. They're going to invite other local high schools next year. They're going to take a day and they're going to designate it for this type of event. <coughs> they're going to use what we did as a model to have other high schools bring students in and have the same experience that we had. But the, the individuals from those colleges, the plan was all done by all of them and it was absolutely wonderful. I wanted to make sure those Thank folks you. were recognized. Thank you. Right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Are you comfortable? <coughs> yes. Okay. 8.0. I'm sorry. 7.0. Report. report. I'll just go quickly through a few things. A reminder to sign up for the Chamber's annual meeting, May 19th at 5.30 at Piper Shores. Yeah. If you haven't done so already, it was a really nice event last year. Um, we did express appreciation to our staff this week in honor of Teacher Appreciation Week. If there are any parents or students out there who have a special teacher in mind or someone they'd just like to thank, you still have time to do that tomorrow or Monday. It would be a great idea. Just write a little note. That's, that's all they need. They don't need a gift. So uh, we appreciate our teachers, and it's nice for them to hear from you. Um, May 27th is the Maine School Boards Association Day at the State House. It's called Invest in Kids. School board members around the state will have an opportunity to gather together beginning at 10.30 in the morning in Augusta at the Cross Office Cafe and then move to the State House. And um, they will be um, urging legislators and you'll have an opportunity to meet with your own legislators to advocate for students. So um, I'm, I'd love to go and if anyone else is interested, just let me know. Maybe we can carpool. Um, let's see, one other thing is our teacher retirement celebration is coming up pretty soon, May 28th. So you might want to keep that on, on the agenda as well. And that's the end of my report. Do we have any committee reports? And Mrs. Murphy. We do have a lot going on in policy. Um, as you can see from the agenda, we continue to slog through the um, policy manual. We're reviewing every policy. Um, including some that have been recently updated, but there are some that have not been reviewed in decades. So we are going from oldest to newest and reviewing and um, updating if necessary and revising um, every policy as we go along. So there's a bunch on the agenda tonight and we continue to meet every other Wednesday, including next Wednesday, which is will be at 10 o'clock because it's a late start week. Very good. Thank you. Um, I have communications, and we just continue to disseminate information via our Facebook page um, through the local media. We, Donna and Chris have both um, written articles for the leader, and Chris and Sean Babine, as chairs of the finance committees on our respective councils, have also submitted articles. So it's just a way to sort of make sure the correct information is getting out there. Um, so we can continue to do that. If there's something specific that you'd like more information on, you can always email the board or the town council. Then the only other thing I had was about the community dialogue. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I sat in on two different discussions about communication, and a lot of great ideas came out of that, so I'm hoping that that might be one of the, the main topics that 
get filtered through? And if not, maybe there's a way to create some sort of ad hoc committee of community members. There, you know, the library was in one of my discussions, and there were a lot of different sort of cross-section of, of people around town. Uh, well, it's been a very busy month in finance. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, the chairperson for helping me through this process with my, my gift. Um, I'll, I'll start off with the public budget form that we had on April 29th. I, I, I thought it was very successful uh, as a first time around process. I know many of you were there as well. Um, I'd, I'd be very curious to hear your feedback from the other side of the table. Of what it was like in the audience, but it certainly felt like it was a success from, from our perspective. Um, uh, we, we fielded, I believe, 124 questions total or something like mm -hmm. something along those lines. Um, certainly, um, you know, we'll, we'll review that process again next year. I think it was beneficial. Hopefully the, the community found it beneficial as well. Um, regards to the Joint Finance Committee, uh, I, I can't really stress enough the, the um, appreciation I have for Councillor Baybine, Councillor uh, Donovan, and Councillor Hayes for taking the time to go through that process with us. Um, we may not agree, and we may have some very strong disagreements amongst our groups, but I think it was a good format and a good setting to have discussions. We've wrapped that process up uh, effectively for, for this year in terms of our one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, the last meeting that we had, we did discuss a revised one-to-one -one proposal. Uh, we agreed to support the town finance group with some data for their recommend recommendations on May 13th that they'll be making to the council. Um, and we also agreed that um, because we're not going to have an opportunity to meet again as two bodies before uh, the second reading of the budget, we'll, we'll come back together again at the end of the budget process and do a, a, a lessons learned type of, of setting where we can go through and and uh, try and set the tone, hopefully, very positively moving forward for next year, what we, what we did well, what we could do better, um, what didn't work so well, and maybe will change. So, Finance bit tonight, um, we, <coughs> we reviewed and confirmed uh, a, a revision to our one-to-one -one proposal that we'll be forwarding on to the uh, finance, Town Finance Committee uh, for, for their consideration in the, in the overall budget, um, and we will be uh, moving that forward with our second reading and adoption. Um, that's the the plan unless something changes. Uh, third quarter financials were presented for initial review by the finance. Um, those will be posted upon completion of the review by the finance committee. We're just going to go through and, and digest them a little bit and make sure we don't have any questions or, or, or uh, things that need confirmation from Kate. Uh, uh, let's see. The state passed, uh, on a positive note, they passed the Charter School Funding Act. I'm not sure what the name of that was, but basically that moves the cost of charter schools out of our budget and into the general state budget. Um, that's a positive thing for us on the expenditure side. It may have a slight negative impact us on, for us on the EPS side, but overall it's a positive thing for Scarborough, so that's very helpful. There are still some legislative issues, and Jackie can probably speak to more, them more directly, that are still in play that could affect the EPS formula. So we are in close communications with the town about those things, and we want to make sure that we're, we're aware of what those are, how they might impact us, and uh, move forward in a hopefully positive, positive way. Uh, upcoming dates, uh, let's see, we have, um, next week we have a uh, town council finance meeting uh, on the 13th at 4 o'clock. That's not a joint finance committee meeting, but they will be looking at some of our information to make their recommendations to the town council. So I would suggest and, and hope that uh, at least our finance committee will be present there. I know Dr. Andrews will plan on attending. Uh, then at 7 o'clock, we actually have a joint workshop between the full board and the full council, and we're hoping that's an opportunity for them to review some of the data we provided, ask some questions, get some feedback, um, and, and give us another opportunity to clarify any questions or concerns that they might have. Then we have uh, on May 20th is the Town Council's second reading and voting on uh, for the budget approval, <coughs> followed by the Thursday. Following Thursday, we have our second reading and budget vote. So that's 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 it. I'll be very happy at the end of next month. I just need to amend our policy committee meeting. I knew something sounded wrong about it. 
next Wednesday, actually, at least the two of us are going to be, um, and Donna, I think we're going to be at the school law conference at Drummond and Woodsum. So we moved our policy communications meeting to Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock. Just wanted to make sure. Everybody knew in case they wanted to all come in droves. Uh, first, uh, uh, since our last meeting, I have attended a board meeting from Maine School Boards Association at which the acting commissioner uh, spoke with us for about an hour. And of note is the fact that he said that the state is not happy with the with the uh, platform being used for the testing. It, evidently, there were a lot of glitches <coughs> around the state with, with that testing platform. So they will be investigating other platforms moving forward. Don't ask me what he hasn't. The, uh, uh, on Monday, I testified on behalf of Maine School Boards Association on LD 1010, which is the bill that would, uh, was asking that schools or public employers actually could outsource without having to negotiate uh, for other than direct uh, people having direct contact with children. Uh, I mean, school boards did ask that that be uh, separated from the right to work piece because there were five or six bills on the right to work piece and this was thrown in with it and therefore uh, it was considered a union breaking uh, bill and uh, it is still alive but just barely so it will go before uh, it'll go to the floor uh, but it doesn't appear to have a lot of legs uh, we are continuing, we just completed negotiations with our administrative group and we'll sign that contract this evening, thank goodness, and it was a, a very nice negotiations. We got a lot of minutiae out of the contract that was not needed there because it's covered by law and by policy and by their personal uh, contracts. And we are continuing our ongoing negotiations with our custodian cafeteria workers. And we have a meeting on that next week. The Sebago Education Alliance met April 13th in Buxton, and there was an Alliance school update um, about the closing of the school, though the Alliance will still be functioning for other programs. Um, Dr. Entwistle had met with staff out at the school um, and had helped them work on resumes and things to help them look for new jobs. So I know that everybody at the Alliance School had appreciated that and so did the other superintendents. So thank you for doing that. Um, and Mr. Gauss uh, from Westbrook, Westbrook, Westbrook. I to think. Um, Westbrook um, was actually going to go speak to staff just to kind of give them how things were going to keep progressing. Um, summer workshop, there will be a summer workshop on strategic planning for the future on um, what kind of programs will go on and things like that. So that does not have a date yet. Um, the tech camp is not going to be happening this year. They're looking at other w other things, other opportunities that can come up uh, instead of just a tech camp and doing the same thing every year. There is also going to be an audit and um, list of assets that were left um, for the, from the school uh, to be dispersed. So many of them belong to Buxton, the furniture and things of that nature. So there probably won't much. Um, and that's it. Our next meeting is actually going to be held here, so we won't be having to drive anywhere uh, May 11th, next Monday. So that's it for me now. Jackie, did you want to say something? I would like to update something that, that has occurred at both the budget forum and last evening at the public hearing with regards to backpacks. Oh. There are two backpack programs in town. One is at the beginning of the school year for school supplies. That is run by Project Grace, and many people participate. Kiwanis is only one organization that participates. We have annually provided anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 backpacks, both from Kiwanis and members of Kiwanis. The second program is a food program for families, children, 
I think last uh, vacation that we fed somewhere around 80 children. Kiwanis does, in fact, make generous contributions to that, as do many, many people in the town, as well as, I think, the Chamber and the Rotary and, and the Lions. So it is not just a Kiwanis project providing the backpacks. Uh, it is a community effort, and we are one participant. And I thank people for thinking that we're doing that much, but unfortunately we don't have that much of a resource. To try and help out the town, however, and this is a plug, we are having our annual food drive for the Scarborough Food Pantry ongoing this week. And the drop-offs can be uh, at Saco Benefit Savings and at Ron Forrest Fence until Friday, and then we will have drop-offs Saturday at the Black Point Church and the Dunstan Fire Station. And if every, anybody needs a pickup, just call me and I will see that somebody goes out at a convenient time to pick up food that you might wish to donate. Thank you very much and thank you for letting me say that. Okay, thank you for the clarification. And I'll just report briefly out on the EDT team, that is the uh, Professional Development Teacher Evaluation. Um, they met this afternoon that I attended, and um, I have asked uh, Dr. Entwistle to add them to our workshop agenda coming up next in two weeks because I think it's important for you to meet them and for you to hear uh, the kind of work that they've been doing for two years now on their own time and, um, and also what's ahead because uh, there's, there's going to be some really important days coming up in the next few weeks for our school system on this topic. So, uh, so they'll hopefully be here next time around. And that concludes our committee reports. We have no student representatives this evening, so we have no reports, 10.0 recognition. And I think this is uh, Mr. Legage's um, presentation uh, in terms of recognition of the winter uh, athletes and athletics. Well, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here, but um, our, our coaches have patiently waited, so I'm going to let them get right to it. So <laughs> let me introduce first Coach Ron Kelly, girls indoor track. Thank you for the recognition. Uh, two captains here of, of the group that we had, Kayla Griffiths and uh, <laughs> no, by. Jennifer Douglas. Um, <laughs> It was another excellent year for us. We were still in a rebuilding mode. Last year, I think we were ninth or tenth in the state, but not that far out of first place. I think it was like 10 or 12 points. This year, we still had a very young team. Uh, we had one loss during the regular season. However, when it came to the conference championship, uh, we thought we had a chance of winning it, and we did actually quite easily. I uh, went to the state meet, and even during part of the meet, we were leading, but uh, some of the points from Thornton hadn't uh, really developed yet. But uh, we ended up third, uh, definitely on the right track. Uh, you know, really only losing one girl um, that scored points this year off the team, and everybody else is back for one or two years. So it looks promising again for next year. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. And boys indoor track, Coach Veyu. Thank you, and uh, congratulations to all the uh, sports teams that uh, competed this winter, and big shout-out to the hockey team for winning the state title. Um, boys indoor track had another uh, successful uh, campaign, uh, undefeated regular season for the sixth straight year, um, won the SMAA championship um, for the sixth straight time and uh, scored a record, 215 points in that championship. Uh, it's one of the finest uh, moments I think the program's had in its illustrious career. Um, the next closest team was 99 in the championship meet. That's pretty good. Um, unfortunately, at the state meet, we went in as favorites, and, uh, you know, we had won four straight titles, and uh, they don't give you the title when you walk in the door, unfortunately. But... Uh, we came up just short, three points. We had the lead heading into the final relay, and, um, you know, Falmouth had the fastest relay, and they won. Second fastest time ever in the state they ran. And our boys fought all the way to the end and got fourth. Um, so, you know, 
we'll, we didn't win the championship, but we learned some good lessons out of that, and uh, you know those guys will be better for it in the end. And most of those guys will be back next year, and we also have a lot of them competing in the outdoor season, and they're really motivated. So it was nice to see them take that loss in stride and uh, you know focus. We had two individual state champions on the year, um, Hugh McSorley in the shot put and Jacob Terry in the two mile. That was two straight for Jacob. And we had school records in the pole vault and the distance medley. Um, so looking forward to another outstanding uh, campaign next year, and hopefully we'll get back to the top. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. And girls basketball, Coach Tierdano. My second year with the program um, gave some stability to the girls. Uh, they'd been making some changes. So I was glad to work with the kids for two years in a row. I'd like to thank the administration for making my job so easy, uh, Mr. Legage uh, and Mr. Creech. Um, one thing I'd like to let you know, the facility that those kids get to practice and compete in is uh, second to none. Uh, our kids are very fortunate to be in that building over there, and uh, we're really fortunate to have that uh, set up. And I'm just really proud of that. And when other teams come in, they look around, that you can see their eyes go up, and they're going, wow, this is pretty cool. And we're fortunate to have it every day. Um, very impressed with our student athletes at Scarborough. Um, they're very mature, very respect respectful, uh, love to be coached, want to be coached, want to be pushed hard. That makes our jobs as coaches much easier. Um, we had 26 girls in our program this year. Um, our JV and our first team both had successful seasons. The varsity finished at 9-9, nine and nine and we're very competitive in 15 of the 18 games that we played. Um, any coach would tell you that uh, coaches the team sport that you want to be playing your best at the end of the year. I thought we were. Uh, we upset South Portland in the last regular season game. Played probably our best game of the year in a preliminary game to get to the, uh, to the expo. We beat a, Mar a good Marshwood team. And then uh, our team goal every year is to get to the semifinals which is the first game, night's games at the Civic Center. And uh, we uh, hung with Thornton Academy, which ended up winning the Western title for three quarters, but we fell up a little bit, just a little bit short. Um, three seniors are going on to uh, compete collegiately uh, at different sports. Uh, Sam Sparta is going to Southern New Hampshire to play soccer. Bailey Adams will be going to St. Michael's to play lacrosse. And Ashley Briggs will be playing basketball on a scholarship at St. Anselm's. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Coach Tobias, boys basketball. Thank you, and I also want to echo what Mike has to say about the basketball program. Um, I also want to thank uh, Mr. Legage, Mr. Creech, excellent administrators, and also the facilities here at Scarborough are excellent. And uh, also, what, what, like Mike, Mike said, it was it's really uh, the best in the state, no question about it. Uh, basketball program this year, the, the boys, was a very, very competitive basketball team in a very difficult league. We made the playoffs, and um, and I felt it was a great accomplishment for us, uh, and gave Deering a, a great game in the first round. Came a, up a little bit short, but I uh, was very, very proud of how the boys played all year long, especially in that game against Deering. Uh, we had two players who uh, deserve a, a special notice. Uh, Milani Hicks and Nate Wessel. Nate was a third-team all-conference player for us, and Milani uh, was a first-team all-conference uh, player, uh, also a McDonald's all-star uh, uh, participant, uh, which is a great honor, and also was an honorable mention all-state uh, selection. So I think uh, both those boys, along with the whole team, uh, did very, very well this year. Um, in conclusion, as far as a basketball coach, I look for uh, three things uh, from any team. Uh, come to practice and practice very hard. Uh, play hard in every game and compete. And they play together at, like a team. And if I look at all three of those um, uh, goals that we set forth at the beginning of the year, uh, I think they accomplished all three of those goals. And I was very, very proud of all of them. Um, and as far as a coach, that's all you can ask. And I, uh, we had a really good and uh, very, very coachable uh, group. And uh, we have a lot of uh, very talented young players coming up through the system. And I think the future is bright for uh, Scarborough boys basketball. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Coach. Coach Latara with wrestling. My name is Brian Latart. I'm uh, actually the assistant wrestling coach. Coach Stevenson, unfortunately, couldn't be here today, but uh, I want to echo the other coaches. Um, definitely to um, uh, Mr. Legage for supporting our program. If uh, the parents and the council doesn't know what wrestling is, it's not WWE on TV, okay? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, and, and unlike any sport in the town of Scarborough, and I hate to single us out, wrestling is truly the only co-ed sport here in, in Scarborough. We had four females on our team this year, um, and uh, it was uh, it's pretty trying to uh, try to teach wrestling skills to the females, but uh, we get through it, and, and the, the boys accept them wholeheartedly, and they came together. It was great. Um, wrestling is an individual sport and also a team sport, very similar to track and uh, tennis and swimming, so to speak. So, Unfortunately, as a team, we don't win many meets, but uh, when we go to tournaments, uh, the wrestlers really perform well. Uh, this year, we had a freshman wrestler, uh, Jeremy Sandrowski, won um, a state championship as a freshman. That's pretty much unheard of. Um, so hopefully, uh, if he continues that success, sophomore, junior, senior year, uh, the sky's the limit for this kid. Uh, unlike other sports, uh, my... My definition of wrestling is um, it's more like a trust chess match. Excuse me. It's not always the biggest, strongest guy that's going to win. Chuck, you're always trying to outmaneuver, outthink your opponent. And that is truly what we try to teach these kids is to slow down, so to speak. What we instill in them is probably what every other coach does, you know, confidence, dedication, discipline, worth ethic. And, um, you know, we, we took our lickings a couple years ago, the wrestling program, so to speak, um, but with the support of the, the administration and Michael Gage, we've overcome that, and uh, we've got a great bunch of kids, and, uh, you know, it, it's a pleasure. Um, so thank you for, for having me. Thank you. Uh, Coach Cashman with Girls Hockey. Go. <laughs> See, when I'm on the bench, the refs ask me to put my helmet on, and I have to remind them that I'm 30 years old, not <laughs> so, with that be. There we go. Sorry, Norm, you have to put this up. Um, so I don't want to repeat everything the other coaches said, but um, Mike Legage, especially this season, has been so supportive. Um, ice hockey, we all know it's an expensive sport. Um, finding ice time this year was almost nearly impossible. So Norm and I, there were times, two, three times a week, we were traveling to Auburn, um, not getting home till 11.30 midnight, and my girls, and I know his boys, were up on time and going to school, so they just have fantastic time management skills, and without Mike Legage's support, this hockey program wouldn't be nearly as successful as we have been in the last few years. This season, I had 17 underclassmen, I had 12 freshmen, um, so a lot of the teams in the state wrote us off the year before. We went undefeated and won states. Um, unfortunately, we didn't repeat that, but this was the most fun I've ever had. This is my ninth season coaching. I have the toughest, most resilient girls I've ever met. Um, they've gone through a lot this year. We ended up in Western Finals, lost 4-2, to two, but we outshot, we outshot Falmouth. Of course, I'm biased, and I thought we outplayed them. Right? <laughs> I get a little passionate on the bench. You can't tell. It's fine. There's times when Mike looks at me and I'm like, got it. So, um, Norm knows too. So, um, but really, just really good girls. We're really excited to see what um, you know the next few years bring. Uh, Sammy Shoebottom scored 48 goals this season. That's the most any girl hockey player has scored in the state. She won Winter Athlete for the Forecaster as well as the Portland Press. Is a fantastic representation for Scarborough. And I just felt it was important to note my girls um, suffered a pretty tragic loss this season. I'm sure 
some of you in this room may be aware of it, but we have um, sisters on the team who lost their brother tragically, and we had a game that night, and the administration did a really excellent job in providing support to my girls, and my girls could have fallen apart um, that game for the rest of the season, and instead they came together and really moved forward as a team, and I think it goes to show that sports really create a safe and supportive atmosphere for kids to learn that resiliency and move forward. Um, if you can't tell by the way I talk, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. <laughs> um, so I always, and I know I said this last year, and then I'll stop talking, but I think it's really important. I know you guys are going to the state house. Um, I have to go as a social worker, but the more we cut and the more we look at numbers and dollar signs, I think those who may be in power forget that those numbers and dollar signs are the kids. And I see it every day. When you cut, I see and I hear what happens to those kids. So I just hope that people continue to advocate because we have some pretty awesome kids in our program. So, Norm, it's all you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Coach Norm Gagne, um, I'll just say that when I introduce Coach, that uh, he did receive Coach of the Year honors um, this year, and also boys hockey won their first ever state championship in Scarborough history this year. Um, coach Gagne is certainly a veteran coach. Um, he is just a few wins away from some major landmarks. Um, uh, nine wins, I believe, from uh, being ranked second most successful high school hockey coach in the nation, um, and uh, and about 12 wins away from um, 700 career wins wow. uh, for a high school coach. So um, we're very fortunate to have ho all the coaches here, but um, this year has been especially um, a wonderful opportunity for the boys' program. I'll let Coach Gagne speak, uh, speak a little bit more about this season. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank uh, uh, Mr. Creech and uh, Mr. LaGage for all the support they've given uh, our hockey program this year. I know that uh, this has been an unbelievable season for me. I've been doing this for 40 years, and uh, I've had uh, a lot of uh, great teams over the years. But uh, this is a special, special and magical year. We faced a, a lot of adversity throughout the year, not only uh, with finding practice time and traveling to Auburn and playing home games in Auburn, but uh, also on the ice. We, uh, we suffered a lot of injuries this year. I don't know why. In my 40 years, I've never seen anything like it. We've had a, from uh, broken collarbones to uh, concussions and what have you. But uh, we never played with the same uh, lineup each night from day one to the end of the year. It was, it was just unbelievable. And uh, coupled with that, we had eight players that had to play uh, major roles on the varsity level for the first time. And a lot of people don't understand that uh, in, a, in a sport that's physical like uh, we, we, we're playing, uh, to have freshmen and sophomores have to go out and play against uh, some of the teams we play against. We play one of the toughest schedules in the state to play the Lewistons, the St. Dom's, the Falmouth. And Falmouth, uh, they, uh, the Portland Press Herald asked me at the beginning of the year who I thought <clears throat> were the tougher teams in the league this year and who to look out for. And I told them that St. Dom's and Falmouth are going to be the two teams that are going to be back in the state because they had both uh, been in the state championship game, number one, and they were returning most of their players. So they were 12, I, St. Don's had 12 seniors on their team, and uh, I believe Falmouth had 10, and uh, they just had 21 freshmen come in that, that year too, this last year. So uh, my expectations of the, the year was to, I hoped that we could end up in the top four. Uh, and that was a stretch that I felt. But as the season went on and we got to our 10th or 11th game, we were facing Falmouth. And they had only given up three goals all season in 11 games, uh, 10 games, three goals. 
and uh, I think the odds were really stacked against us, having lost uh, one of our top goal scorers in game one with a broken collarbone. Uh, really put a damper on what we were looking at. And I was just thinking, if we can only keep it close. Well, we got into the uh, first period, and just near the end, we got a five-minute major from hitting from behind. And I had three players injured with the uh, trainer. And my assistant coach looked at me and said, what are we going to do? I said, we got to get survive this next five minutes, and then we'll figure it out in the locker room. And we did. Uh, we gave up one goal in that five-minute span. And the, part of that five minutes, we were, we were fi- it was five on three. And we, we gave up only one goal. So I went into the locker room after that and made a few adjustments. But I told the kids, I said, you're never going to face the adversity that you're facing right now the rest of the season. I've never had a team have to, uh, uh, had to uh, uh, face the adversity that they were facing at that point. And I said, and you're only one goal from tying this game. Well, we went out in that first minute of the second period and tied the game up on a power play and tied the game up. And uh, shortly after that, in the third period, we ended up uh, going ahead 2-1 to one and ended up winning that game 3-1. to one. After that game, I told the seniors, I said, I really believe that we could win a state championship with this team now that I see what we've, we can do. And I said, but I don't think the younger players understand that. So the next practice, we went to uh, Auburn. And uh, the St. Dom's locker room was just down the hall from ours. And it was empty. So I took the eight young men that we had, the two freshmen and the six sophomores, in that locker room before we went out to practice. And I told them, I said, listen, I said, I really believe that we can win a state championship, but I've got to get you guys to believe that too. And I said, you've got to keep it simple. Uh, A lot of times, I said, you've got to get over the fear factor. And one of the boys says, what's that, coach? I says, you've got to stop going out on the ice and just running around hoping that you're going to survive. (laughs) (laughs) And it's hard. It's difficult. And I says, if you can all learn that and get over that, Everything's easy after that. And little by little and game by game and practice by practice, they got better. But you don't do that without good leadership. And we had some excellent uh, leaders this year who uh, really nurtured the young kids, built their confidence, uh, got them to understand to keep it simple in their roles because all of those seniors had been there before. They were the young guys on the team. Those are the ones that had to find and get over the fear factor and do those things and keep it simple, and we did that. And I've never been more proud of a group that has done what they've done, uh, being able to trust one another, uh, taking responsibility for their job on the ice, uh, being over, over, able to overcome adversity. And I think one of the most important things was believing in each other and believing in themselves. And... Uh, I look at the Falmouth game. The Falmouth has knocked us out of the uh, playoffs the past three years, semifinals and twice in the Western Main final. So I told them in that game, I said, tonight's the night that we're going to break the door down and we're going to beat them. Well, with eight minutes left in the game, we were down three to one, and we took a five-minute major. And I'm saying, it's over. But we found a way, and within that next five minutes, we went from three to one to five to three. I couldn't believe it. But these kids, that's what they, they never gave up, and they just fought to the end. And that's something I've been trying to teach them for the last five years, is to not give up and to do that and to be able, it's not what happens, it's how you react to what's happening. And they did that. And I think they learned some, some uh, valuable lessons, life lessons in that game. And then uh, when uh, we went up against St. Dom's, after beating Falmouth, we stayed over to watch the St. Dom's-Lewiston game, and it was scary to see those two teams. Uh, they're so fast. And, and uh, the 12 seniors for St. Dom's are just unbelievable players. I think they placed uh, seven 
people on the uh, Eastern All-State all team. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we found a way. I, the, our kids, uh, and I have to give credit to uh, Mr. Legage for uh, giving us the uh, the software huddle where we were able to uh, take our game films, break them up, uh, put little notes and send them out to the kids on their computers at home and let them critique themselves. I told them the first time we sent it out, I said, you got some homework tonight. You've got to find out, uh, take the clips, write down what you did well and what you, and then and, and, and coach yourself and what you didn't do well and learn from those mistakes. And it was so valuable by the end of the year. I mean, they, they improved so much by just doing that. And, uh, and when they were so easy to coach. They were eager to learn and easy to coach. And it makes it our, uh, my job a lot easier having kids like that. It's, um, I, in, like I said, in the seven state championships that I've been able to achieve with my players, this one is so, so special. I told them they were at the top of the list because the, the, our expectations were never to do what we did. But I want to thank you all for having us and thank Michael Gates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, let me just wrap up by saying that um, Coach French, our swim coach, was uh, was here early. I had to leave, uh, uh, unfortunately, but did want me to share that they had 33 boys and 20 girls in the swim program this year. Uh, <coughs> they had eight first-year swimmers uh, in the program, and I know this sounds amazing, but uh, they have a lot of opportunities, I think, but they had over 300 personal best times this year um, in the swim program. They averaged about 37.5 best times each meet. Um, so they were uh, really fortunate and had a great uh, swim season. Uh, coach uh, Marsanskis, who's our cheering coach, they had a, a great op a season this winter. They went to the state championship and competed in Augusta and um, just just had a fabulous season, not only supporting our teams cheering on the sideline, but um, winter cheering is competitive. That they, they have their own competitions, and they did real well this year as well. Uh, coach Mills with Alpine Skiing um, could not be here this evening, but our boys – uh, Alpine ski team um, were the SMAA champions this year and had a, uh, two students that competed in a state championship and the girls were our, our league runners up in Alpine skiing. Uh, Nordic skiing was down a little bit this year. We had um, about uh, six to 12 students um, that participated. It fluctuated um, from day to day and um, and that program, um, we're not sure what's going to happen with Nordic skiing moving forward. Um, so all in all, uh, very exciting. As you heard Coach Gagne and the other coaches speak about the importance of the skills that are achieved um, through educational athletics, and uh, those skills um, are certainly critical to a, a student's maturation. So um, we're, we feel really uh, confident that the things that we do in athletics and act activities are important to a holistic education. Um, and we have, we're very fortunate to have great leaders um, leading our students um, and exceptional students who have to balance a lot. You heard... Um, some talk about uh, ice times and and pool times are the same way and, and late evenings and early mornings and and still our students um, uh, functioned at a high level academically so uh, we're really fortunate so questions I have Go ahead. Sorry. Um, one more time, Mike. I know we talk about this quite a bit, but mm -hmm. could you please reiterate the uh, participation rate, student, uh, roughly percentage of student participation rate in athletics? I think that we are comfortably in athletics and student activities together. I think we're comfortably um, in the high 80s and low 90s of students that participate in some after-school activity, which is really unheard of. We're really <laughs> fortunate. Um, we have anyways between three and 500 students participate in athletics um, in any particular season, and um, 
and we just have a huge turnout and huge uh, number of students that participate in club activities. For example, in our key club, I think we have over 100 students right now that uh, participate just in our key club program and, and provide a lot of good community service for um, Scarborough and surrounding towns in Scarborough. Thank you. We're very fortunate. Yes. And, and the key clubber was just elected New England governor for all of key clubs. Ms. Jameson. Okay. Yes. No. I, I just have a comment. Um, I want to congratulate all of the coaches. Um, my family this winter went to the majority of the girls or the boys basketball games. And I have to say, I'm a 1992 grad of South Portland High School. So I feel very comfortable with the, <laughs> the basketball coaching staff here. <laughs> but congratulations to all of you. I just, I just, uh, I enjoy the whole participation piece. As you know, I attend a lot of activities, uh, both ball games and and other activities, and I am just so proud of our students. And and those of you who coach, you probably don't know this about me, but Mike does. One one of the reasons I sit across from the coach, I'm very into a coach's demeanor with our children. And that's extremely important to me as a board member. And I am very proud to say that, that I am very pleased and proud of the people whom we have coaching our students. Very good. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much, and congratulations on a great <laughs> Second. Any discussion? I'm going to abstain from this as I was not here March 19th. Anyone else? Anything to say? Any corrections? Seeing none. Okay. All in favor? Five. Thank you. 11.2 minutes of March 26th. Um, do I have a motion? Move Ooh. approval as presented. Second. Any corrections, deletions, anything? Okay, very good. All in favor? Six. Thank you. 11.3, a motion to approve a donation from the Discover Brighter Futures Fund, Discover High School. Is anyone here to represent that? David, uh, were, you, were you planning on um, addressing this, or shall I uh, do it? I'm sorry, Mr. He, stu he distracted you. I, 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 saw, I saw that happening. Um, this, uh, this relates to John McHugh's um, don donation that he is, has accepted. Uh, do you want me to cover the details? Okay, um, this is a, the Discover Pathway to Financial Success Program, and it's a grant that is, has been given by the Discover Brighter Futures Fund to the Scarborough Public Schools to be used for financial education. Um, and financial education curriculum. It's a fairly um, sizable grant. Uh, it is uh, $7,280, and, um, and basically the, the person um, connected to this at the high school is John McHugh. So I would recommend um, that the board accept uh, this incredible um, grant. Wow. Do I have a motion for that? Move approval. I said, yeah, so move. Jackie okay. was first. Second. <laughs> I just, <laughs> yep. I said one thing, it was 7,820. 820. Okay. That's the second. $8 I'm going to go, I'm going to go with what Christine says. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Do we know what it will be used for? It is um, specifically to be used for, uh, to promote financial education of students and to, um, I guess, purchase curriculum for the purposes of financial education. And I don't think that we can do enough for that. Thank you. Very good. All in favor? Six. And now we have um, Steph Cox is here. She's the executive director of Project Grace. 
you want to uh, talk a little bit? Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, come before you tonight. Project Grace, um, we'd also like to thank you, Jackie, for mentioning the backpacks and our partnerships with Kiwanis. Um, we had a very fun evening on uh, April 9th was the first ever Junior Trivia Bee hosted by the Builders Club, which is part of Kiwanis. And we want to commend Ian Engelman and all the teachers and staff at the middle school and also the welcome that we got from Wentworth School for the very first ever Trivia Bee for the middle school students. There were trophies. There was lots of fun. Those kids are smart. It's amazing. And we're going to have another one next year and hope all of you will join us there. And we thank you um, for the chance to give them recognition. Uh, tonight I came, uh, I'm coming before you to present a check for $2,500 from Project Grace. Um, we have, for the past few years, been providing this money to the school nutrition program. And it's our hope that by investing in the nutrition program, we're also investing in student success. As you all know, you cannot pay attention if you're hungry. And um, unfortunately, there are a lot of hungry kids in Maine and, and right here even in Scarborough, too. And uh, Jackie Perry and, and others can certainly um, attest to that, as well as Kelly Murphy, who helps with that backpack program during the holidays. Um, I just can't believe it that peanut butter is a luxury, you know? We have to put an end to that. <laughs> um, so that's what this grant is about. It's to give kids um, a little extra. Um, the, the staff in the nutrition program are keenly observant. They have good hearts, and they know what they're doing when it comes to taking care of kids and making sure they're eating healthy, uh, nutritious food. And these grants provide things like um, milk for 183 kids, uh, snacks over 4,000 snacks, or about 4,000 snacks. Lunches, um, second helpings for kids who don't get enough at home. Um, you know, as you can see, it's, it's, just, it's just not right that kids are hungry. And so we can do something about it. That's what this grant is about. Um, you can also see work that Project Grace is doing to support the Scarborough Food Pantry, whether it's food drives, initiating a, a community garden to grow vegetables for the food pantry, and a number of other things. So you can visit us on projectgracemain.org. That's a commercial. <laughs> and uh, support our work uh, as you can. And thank you very much um, to the school board for having us tonight. We partner a lot with all of the schools. Um, we receive referrals. Um, from social workers and school nurses. Cindy Fasulo is a wonderful liaison with the nurses and staff there. Um, we're able to buy a pair of sneakers for a kid who doesn't have one or make sure everybody has hats and mittens. There are some good knitters here in Scarborough. Nobody should be without a hat and mittens. They take good care of everybody. So uh, it's been a long night. Um, I want to thank you again for, for your support and, and help with Project Grace. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Do I have a motion to... Move to uh, um, accept the donation. Second. Second. Very good. All in favor? Six. Thank you. And again, that's a, a generous donation of $2,500. Thank you very much. 11.5, motion to approve a $2,000 donation from the Wilkinson Foundation to go to the Wentworth School Garden. Is there someone here to speak on that? I don't or? believe so. Okay. Um, this is um, from the Wilkinson Foundation, and, um, and it's uh, specifically uh, Catherine Hewitt who secured this um, donation. It is a 2,000 donation from that foundation, and, um, and that's a great thing for the new Wentworth School Garden. Okay, about that, Joanne? Nope, I just okay. wanted to mention Catherine Hewitt's name because she's done a lot of work in the planning and design of the Scar uh, yeah. Garden. Very good, and that's a very generous donation. I just had a quick question. I, we're going to grow vegetables in that for the cafeteria, is that correct? Or is that more yeah, of a... They're eventually going to get there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, do I have a motion to oh. accept that donation? <laughs> Move <laughs> approval as presented. Second. And any other discussion? Very good, I'll approve. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
next item, motion to approve the bargaining contract between the Scarborough Board of Education and the Scarborough <coughs> Administrative <coughs> Association. Do I have a motion here? Uh, move approval. Second. Any discussion? None. All in favor? Six. Very good. And 11.7. Second reading of the 2015-16 school calendar. Do I have a motion to consider this? Second reading. Move approval. Excuse me. Um, I believe we're just going to go right ahead on our uh, new business. They can public okay. comment does come before the motion. Yep. yep. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak? Who if you haven't spoken already on the topic and you have something to say. My name is Michelle Markham. We continue to hear Scarborough schools want to improve. Although there are many things I'm very proud of in our Scarborough schools, I am in support of continuous improvement and the desire to further improve our schools. We also hear that in order to improve our schools, we need additional professional development for our teachers. This too I am in support of as long as it's not disruptive to the students. Yet the calendar that's been presented to the board utilizes late starts as a means for professional development, which has been voiced by many parents as disruptive to students. Most of the main schools in the area that are ranked higher than Scarborough schools utilize either early release or in-service teacher workshop days. For example, Yarmouth utilizes in-service, Falmouth early release, Cape Elizabeth a combination of in-service and early release days, and Wells in-service days. There's been some reference to the Kennebunk schools utilizing additional late starts for their high school students, but I'd like to inform you they also have the ability to have an additional bus route for the high school students. So the students arrive at school at the scheduled late time. Scarborough plans to bus the high school students to the high school at the same time as the middle school students. Thus, any benefit they would gain to sleep in has been eliminated. Additionally, in the prior meeting, Joanne Sizemore mentioned that less than 300 high school students currently take the bus, which seems very light considering the school has in excess of 500 students just in the 9th and 10th grades. Many students that receive rides from their parents also have siblings in the middle school. For these students, they are likely to therefore be dropped off at the high school at the same time as the middle school starts school day. Therefore, increasing the number of students in the library and cafeteria waiting for the school day to begin. I'd like to refer to the school board policy EEAA, the Student Transportation Services. It states the Scarborough School Department will provide transportation at the beginning and end of the school day for all students living beyond a reasonable distance from their school or from a scheduled bus as approved by the board. It also states it is the board's intent that transportation be scheduled and routed in a way that best serves the educational interest of students and the operations of the school. I feel the proposed calendar has not had the consequences fully considered. Additionally, I feel Scarborough should follow the lead of other successful main schools and implement their calendars rather than attempting to create their own without any proven record of success. I'd like to remind you that the primary reason the proposed school calendar was voted down last meeting was due to the increased number of late starts for the high school students. Yet the only apparent change in the revised calendar is the elimination of early releases. As always, I would like to thank you for your continued dedication to our children, your students. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Leslie Gleistein, 14 Long Meadow Road. Um, I'd just like to urge you to uh, realize the impact that this issue um, has had, you know, on your support throughout the community, and to um, uh, really consider that. Uh, you know, it, it might be time to just keep what we have and then work hard next year as all together as a team. Um, I'm looking at the Yarmouth School Quality Survey, the first annual survey they put out um, that asks a lot of questions of parents and students. Um, 
school calendar doesn't have to be one of them, but um, I just think there's a lot of collaboration that we can do together. Um, I really feel that you're going to lose a lot of goodwill um, through this calendar process because of unfortunately how the how the whole thing has progressed and i i don't I'm not you know saying oh it was it was anyone's fault, but it just it just happened this time that it has progressed in a very contentious way. And um, I would urge you to consider that because you need the support of a lot of people to uh, support the schools and get the budgets passed. Thank you. Anyone else looking to speak? Being none. Um, so, wait, do we have a motion? Yep. So, move approval of the calendar as presented. Second. Very good. Any discussion from the board? Well, I will just talk about. Um, because we did spend a lot of time in the policy level discussing this revision and removing the two um, district-wide early releases. I spoke a lot at the previous meeting, all the reasons why this can't be put off for a year, in my opinion, because there is immediate improvement in student learning that will happen the day that the first late start happens. The follow-up will continue in the next one. It's immediate. It's impactful. Students who are in the high school will see the results this year in a given week or month. Um, it's absolutely worth the shortening of the school year, which Scarborough, as I stated before, has a longer school year and a longer school day than almost every district, certainly in southern Maine, but um, almost every district in Maine that I've looked at. Um, we've spent a lot of time on this. This is not done haphazardly. This is not done out of spite. This is not done in spite of parental involvement. It's with all that in mind that we went forward and still, in my opinion, in the opinion of the policy committee, is still the best interest of our students to get the education they deserve and will have an immediate impact. Uh, we removed the two early releases that will just, you know, it might eliminate some confusion and does give back those um, four extra hours to uh, kids district-wide. Um, there is no change for K-8. to They will have the um, same 10 late starts they have had for the last two years. Um, the change at the high school is, there are a lot of reasons for it. There's the, hopefully, implementing new technology. There's the reaccreditation. There's the schedule challenges. I mean, there's a lot of issues at the high school that will be immediately improved by having these late starts, and I feel the trade-off is well worth it. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to support this calendar for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the, the recent emails that I have received, and I think most of you have as well, have been supported, supportive of this calendar as a revision. That's number one. Number two, uh, it's a compromise. It's a compromise I can live with. And the third part is that I taught high school, and I went through an accreditation. And it is enormously time-consuming for faculty and administration to do a self-evaluation, put it all together, and then to have three days of visitors coming in uh, to evaluate your self-evaluation. We postponed this for a year because we have a new high school principal. We cannot do an accreditation without time to prepare. And that is why I am going to support this. Those are the reasons, <coughs> not just the one. Yes. So we started this discussion several weeks ago with um, the clear need for a compromise. And by definition, that means everybody has to give up something so that nobody gets everything. Um, do I think this calendar is optimal? I do not. Um, do I think that this calendar is a good compromise? 
Um, I do for the time being, but I do have some reservations that I'd like to share that I don't expect to be necessarily implemented. There are more suggestions that I'd like to, to, to talk about. Um, I would like to see the calendar committee or some ad hoc committee formed. Uh, I'd like to see our student representatives be on that committee, if at all possible. Uh, I'd also like to see that opened up to the parents uh, in terms of a volunteer type of basis, not necessarily an appointment basis type of thing. Um, I would like to see a report out from that committee uh, that gives us at least two or three recommendations moving forward of ways that we could adopt uh, or modify things to maybe try and accommodate everybody else. We'll see. Let's see what they come up with, but task them with that. Uh, I'm not convinced that the transportation is the right approach. That's my one hang-up, one of my major hang-ups with this. I don't think it's, it's, it's not an optimal solution. It's the only solution I think we have now because of our limited resources. So I'm not concerned enough about it to say I can't support it, but I would really like to see some evidence and some feedback about how that's working out when we implement it. I'd like to see... Uh, perhaps a report on absences or tardies for the, the days that it's a high school late start only to make sure that the kids are in fact getting to school and, and, and able to perform on time as expected. And I would like to see a more detailed formal counting of the students who are utilizing the buses because I do think that that's going to be important. If, if they aren't being fully utilized, then we'll have to adjust that some way, somehow, I think. Um, I, well, I think all those are important. Um, I, I don't think it's enough to hold this calendar up. I, I agree wholeheartedly that the time is the, the time necessary at the high school is very evident. I appreciate the fact that the the, the K through eight is really not going to be impacted at all next year, and that's going to give us an opportunity to really come together and do this, I think, in a more collaborative and effective way. But we do have to move forward with something for next year. We can't just paralyze the district. Um, based on uh, some, some issues that I think can be worked out in the future. So I can support the calendar for those reasons. Anyone else? Just to add to Chris's ad hoc committee that we've sort of all talked about for weeks now, um, I would also like to include on that, besides the student reps and parents and school board members, but also maybe a principal or some staff of you know, the teachers that are actually in the trenches. At the different phase levels was one of the thoughts I had with that as well. So, I mean, if you had somebody from the high school who might say, oh, hey, this works out really well for me, oh, this, this becomes an issue for me, or even at the middle school right. or whatever grade it might be. Because there's so, many, there's so many moving parts to this calendar, and it, it's hard sometimes for people to sort of step back from their role with the calendar to, to see how does this impact Mr. Creech or how does this impact my son's first grade teacher. Or, you know, so I think having all of those aspects in the same room talking about it could be beneficial. I'd also like to see come out of that committee, I mean, if a recommendation, I, I don't want us to be limited by the resources that we currently have. If we come up with an optimal calendar, whether it's adding in-service days or whether it's uh, changing uh, late start to early release or something that involves increased investment in transportation, let's put that on the priority list and let's make sure that we're not restricting the calendar based on our limited resources. This is very important to the community outside, not just within our school district, but outside of the parents and business community. Uh, there are many businesses that work in conjunction with the school calendar. So I'd like to see, the, if the recommendation comes out, not necessarily being limited by what we have for resources, but let's come up with the best calendar approach and then let's talk about the resources that we need to invest to achieve that calendar. Can I say one more thing about that? So my vision for this calendar committee is not just late start, early release, what days off, any of that. I really want to take a whole wholesale approach to the calendar. I honestly believe that our high school and perhaps middle school students would benefit from going to school later, swapping with primary school. Primary school kids are generally awake earlier, ready to roll. High school students are not. 
So let's take a look at that. Let's see what works. Let's see if we can make that switch and if we can get um, the stakeholders that would be involved. Obviously, it would be parents K to 12 and then teachers and administrators on board. Then I, I, I would hope that we take a long look at that and not just late start, early release. I know that that's been the focus of this calendar issue this year, but it goes beyond that and absolutely budgetary implications are a huge part of it and is what's handcuffed the proposals to this point. So I would like to really start in the summer, you know, uh, July, August, and go ahead as long as we can until a calendar needs to be presented, which is not until March anyway, right? Yes. Yeah, so it's a long time, and, you know, it will be a lot of work, and I hope that a lot of people are interested in, in joining that because I think a lot of good can come from that, and um, and not even – I am I don't – I think that we have um, a wonderful community in Scarborough, and I, it worries me when an issue does become contentious because I don't believe that um, somebody speaking out against an issue means that they don't support the schools or that they, I would hope, would not, not support the schools because they don't agree with one issue. So this is a great opportunity to prove that in Scarborough and to um, continue the collaboration that we've enjoyed for decades. I just wanted to say some of the similar things that Chris was talking about, like the buses and things like that. Maybe there were opportunities for us to take a look at some things like that within the committee. So I would ask that you all uh, give some consideration as to having some one of you step forward to head up that committee and do you we nominate, and then we would have people um, sending information your way who may be interested in being on that committee. So give it some thought and just let me know and then we can put it out there on a website and we can start getting it together. I'd just like to point out and use one of Dr. Entwistle's tools. We we have, uh, Mr. Legage and I have a, uh, a great sheet that you had offered us that basically li outlines how you want your committee to be formed, your goals, the research. Uh, try, exactly. I, I'd like to see that utilized because I think that's a very effective tool and that will help put the framework in place to help determine the best people that are going to be on that. Okay, it's called charter? A charter. A charter, okay, yeah. very good, okay, great. Um, and I just want to chime in on this too. I, I, I'm, first of all, like I said before, I'm disappointed that the middle school is not included in what the high school work is doing because we're going to need a seamless transition from the middle school students to the high school when it comes to the kind of work that has to be done. So I'd be real disappointed to see a lot of high school work done and the middle school doesn't know what that is all about and is unable to join in with them because they don't have the time. So I'm disappointed about that. Having said that, um, I, I will support this calendar, um, but I would hope that any committee that gets formed also is informed about the degree and the depth of the work that it has to be done that our teachers are facing. Because it's very hard for just average people, and you can include me in that, to understand the amount of work that we're talking about that has to be done by our staff. So I would hope that that's a piece of it, that you engage the, uh, the staff and the administrators, and as well as any of our leadership people who uh, have anything to do with the professional development that is going on for the past two years, for example, um, and the work ahead so that uh, we can begin to help parents understand what this is all about and how it will change education for their children. So that would be mine. Anything else? Very good. All in favor? Six. Thank you. We have a calendar. 11.8, the first reading of policy KJB, distribution of community information. Ms. Murphy, do you want to talk about that? Um, do we want a motion first? A motion. Or? All right, move approval. Second. And no. Uh, sorry, can I just make a suggestion? Do we, re if there aren't any 
changes or anything? Can we take them in bulk, or do you want to do them individually? This one does have changes. Okay. So this is um, a first reading of policy KJB, and there are changes to this. Um, this is distribution of community information, and some changes that were made um, really just outlines that um, we um, would not allow uh, distribution of materials at school events or on school property that do not fall within the guidelines of this policy. Um, and so materials for projects, activities, or programs, the purpose of which is to promote a particular religious, political, or philosophical viewpoint, um, we would not approve a distribution of those at any time on school grounds or at school activities, um, or materials is deemed unsuitable for children. So this is pretty self-explanatory on those. Um, if you have questions about any of the other changes, I'm happy to answer. But it really kind of just updates that um, it's now mostly electronic and it will not be papers and Thursday folders. Primarily, will be there's a link on the website to community information, and it's all all listed there. That we don't endorse the activities that are on there, but we do supply them as a as a public service. So, anyone else? Okay, all in favor? Six. Approved. And 11.9. Do I have a motion on the first reading? B E D D rules of order. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? No changes, correct? No changes? For that one, I believe there are no, no changes to that. Oh, all in favor? So. I'm sorry. Can we take that as a first and a second reading yeah. then? If I, I, just my understanding that if there are no changes, no changes right. that we are doing a first and second, it's just to mm -hmm. okay. to mark it well, that we've that we've looked at it, we've reviewed it, and I'm we're just saying that for the public's benefit. Yeah. Right. So all right. So this is a first and second reading, and that's it. We Correct. Won't okay. All sorry. All in favor? Six. Very good. And now, do we want to just group these together for a motion, uh, Chris? I'll, leave the, I'll defer to the policy chair. Uh, I'd be happy to, to move that. No, that's that's fine with me. Uh, I move for uh, approval. Um, uh, remainder of approval is printed. Second. Ten through thirteen. Yeah. Ten through thirteen. Um, I have a question. So that includes the elimination of one, or just were we doing first readings on? It, it is it if, would. if that's part of the bulk motion. About ten through twelve. <laughs> ten through twelve. Then, 10 that's through fine. 12. Okay. Just in the effort, very just the good. effort of time. That's all. Yep. All right. Very good. Uh, second that. Very good. Oh, second. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Good. All approved. Everybody's getting a little punchy. Yes. And Too many light nights in a row. Thirteen. The elimination mm -hmm. of a non-required policy called CHA, the Development of Administrative Regulation Promotion. Uh, move approval. Second. And discussion. Kelly, do you want to explain this? Um, regulation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that one, right. I was like, why Why were we going to... Because we didn't know what it was. Right. Because this was a, a policy when we all read it individually, and then I brought it to the superintendent. No one could define what this was, especially 3.0. It, they contradict each other. Um, one and three kind of contradict each other. And administrative regulations, because I brought it out, I said, what's an administrative regulation? He said, I don't know what you're talking about. So if we can't understand it, it's not something that's in play. Nobody's using it. It's not required or, or recommended. recommended. It's not on our on our list of from Drummond to Woodson that's required or recommended. It was um, adopted in 1971, revised in 82, and in 2002. And again, 2002 was that magical year where the whole policy manual in one month was <laughs> revised. <laughs> so it was our opinion, the policy committee, um, that we would just eliminate this from the book. Anyone else? Very good. All in favor? Six. It's gone. <laughs> Thank 11. you. 11.14. Appointments. This so is... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I thought you were going to say, um, yeah, this is a high school, middle school spring athletic appointments as presented. 
Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Don't yeah. <laughs> Christine has a question for Mr. Legage. I do. Mr. Legage, oh. is, is this, or Mr. Creech, or perhaps Superintendent Entwistle, um, is this the end of the spring appointments, or are we still, do we still have some outstanding? Still have some, actually. How many are we talking that we have outstanding? Okay. Aren't most of these activities quite rolling underway already? Or Okay. I'll just leave it at that then. <laughs> Anyone else? Sure. Yes. Well, I, <coughs> excuse me, please. It's just nice to see Christy Manning's name on here. She was an outstanding track star here at <coughs> Holy Cross, and it's nice to see her back, and I'm sure her parents are glad she's earning a little money. <laughs> 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 Not much. Aye. All in favor? Six. Eleven point one five donation to Wentworth. This is a, a very generous uh, donation from a citizen and former uh, board member, probably board chair. I guess board chair as well, um, uh, Robert Mitchell, and um, it's in the amount of one thousand um, dollars. With a matching from Unum. So you're accepting both of those donations, the match and Mr. Mitchell's and his family's generous donation. Move approval as presented and graciously accept Mr. Mitchell's 1,000 1, and 1,000 matching from Unum donation. I second. That's great. Very good. Yes. I, I just want to thank Mr. Mitchell. It's nice to see him continue to be actively engaged, even though he's no longer on the board. Uh, and it's greatly appreciated that that consideration continues even after the dedication of participation on the board. So. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell, if you're at home watching us. Yeah. We have to vote. So. Yeah, I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All in favor? Six. Thank you. All right. 12.1, policy ECAD, security camera. Okay, move approval of uh, policy ECAD. It's a security camera system policy, which we have not had previously. Second. Any discussion? So this one. Our second. Yeah, it's the second reading, right? This is um, our second It's reading. the second reading. Second reading. It's, um, so this was unfinished business from the last meeting mm -hmm. when we went too <coughs> late and we right. had to right. roll it over. So it looks like it's been around for a long time, but it really this is just a second reading. Yeah. Um, so are there, I don't know if anyone has any questions about it. We, these are, uh, we pretty much took a framework from Drummond and Woodson for this one, which they recommended um, that school boards adopt. So. <coughs> any questions about that? I have one. Yes. Yeah. Just, I know that there was a note here about that there would be signs placed in the common areas mm -hmm. in the buildings. Do, I mean, are those signs already in place or? No, they're not in place yet. So they'll be in place by September? Probably by or? September. Okay, just checking. So that if somebody says something, we can say that, right. yes, it was noted that by September that they would be placed. They smile, you're on candid camera, or are they going to be more informative? <laughs> a little more. There's going to be a pair of eyeballs. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. An emoticon. Yeah. Big <laughs> ass. Emoji. Anything else? All in favor? Six. And 12.2. ECAC R. Again, security camera. ECAD. Yeah. This is ECAD R. This is the regulation of that policy. That motion? Move approval as presented. Okay. Second. Very good. Any questions on this one? Very good. All in favor? Six. You've been great tonight, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I have my stress ball, so I'm content. <laughs> Perfectly content. Exactly. Just have to keep so it in the box and that works. <laughs> 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 Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Mm. Six. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Very good.
Good. Hey,